let's get started. Um, so DJ Drop Tables is not here today. Uh, he should be here next week. He's a, a bit of a crafty motherfucker. So his, it's his girlfriend's birthday this week, and he blew all his money last week in Vegas. So he lied and told her that he's going to visit his family uh, for Thanksgiving. So that's why he's gone this week. But that's just really get, to get out of a ruse of buying him a present. So um, he'll be back next week. All right. So again, just a reminder for what's on the docket for you guys. Uh, homework five is due next week. Project four will be due after that. Uh, the extra credit for the feedback submission was last night. Um, some people emailed about, about an error because some funky Unicode issue. Uh, but everybody else should have submitted. The final exam will be on December 9th. Actually, they announced the room, but I haven't looked to see where it is. Has anybody looked? Doesn't matter. We'll figure it out. And then um, for, for next week, again, the Oracle talk will be on Monday. The systems potpourri and the final review will be on, on the Wednesday. So we'll do the final review in the beginning, and then we'll, do, uh, we'll cover three or four different database systems that you guys voted on. And I'll just sort of give you, you know, a 10 minute overview of what's interesting about it, why it's good, why it's bad, and so forth. So if you haven't voted yet, please, please go in here and, and vote. The numbers look similar to previous years. Uh, and so again, you can go look at the videos from last year to see what we're going to discuss, but go vote first, then, then go look it up. And then as I said, on Monday, Tuesday, next week, our friends at Oracle are coming, uh, and there's going to be three different talks. So on Monday's class in here, There'll be, uh, we'll have Shashank come and talk about, uh, you know, the, the stuff that he's, his group is building. Again, this is not a recruiting talk. This is like a, you know, scientific or, or a systems discussion of what they're building. And basically, he'll use all the same keywords and buzzwords that I've used throughout the entire semester. So you realize that I'm not, not just making shit up. Um, so he'll come and talk about their system. There's a more recruiting-oriented systems talk. It will be Monday at 4.30 in, in Gates. And that one, there'll be pizza. And then a peer research talk will be on Tuesday, December 3rd, the following day at 12 p.m. on the CIC floor. And so the Hideaki Kimura is, uh, as I mentioned on Piazza, I went to grad school with him. Uh, he's probably one of the most hardcore systems programmers I ever met in my life. He is also the most stubborn man that I've ever met in my life. Uh, when we were building the first, the first summer we were building HDOR, he wanted, we, we had to build our expression trees, like for the where clauses. I had my way of doing it. He had his way. We literally had a four hour debate in my office, just yelling at each other about what to do. And he just broke me down and said, just do it. He was wrong. And we removed what he did later on. And my code's still there. So I was right. But um, in general, he, he's awesome. So he's going to come talk about some, <laughs> he's just come talk about some of the non volatile memory stuff that they've been working on for the system, because he's part of Shashank's group. So again, if you're interested in doing uh, internships or full time uh, positions with them, you know, he will come tell you the kind of things you could be working on, okay? And I'll send reminders about all these things on Piazza. Any questions about any of these? Okay, and then I also make arrangements if you want to meet these guys one-on-one -on -one, uh, to talk about internships and full-time positions as well. Well, I'll send that email. Okay, so last class was the second lecture we had on distributed databases. Remember, the first class was just defining what a distributed database system looks like from an architecture standpoint. What are the, you know, where's data relative to where the computer's, uh, computer's actually going to run on it. And then last class was all about talking about taking these distributed databases when you want to do transactions and making sure that we provide all the asset guarantees that we'd want on a single node system, but now doing this in a distributed environment. And we spend most of our time talking about the atomic commit protocol and replication, because again, that's the hard part of actually having a distributed database when things are split up and now you have transactions doing writes on a bunch of different nodes at the same time. How do you keep it all in sync? How do you avoid losing data? How do you have reads not see stale data if you care about those things? So for today's class, now we're going to sort of up, just leave alone or leave, you know, leave all the transaction stuff we talked about before. And now start talking about how to do analytics, where we're not doing a lot of writes, we're not doing transactions, we're mostly going to be doing reads. But the amount of data we're going to be reading is going to be much larger than uh, what the OLTP transactions were doing from last class. So I just want to show what a sort of a, a, a typical setup would be in an analytical database. And this doesn't, does not necessarily have to be a distributed database, but this is a, this is a common arrangement. So on the front end, you have your OLTP databases. This is where you're ingesting new information from the outside world. 
uh, and this could be distributed, it could be single node, it doesn't matter. And then you want to get all the data from these front-end data silos into your back-end analytical database, sometimes called a, a data warehouse. So there's, there's this uh, process called ETL, or Extract, Transform, and Load. So there's tools you can, you can buy that do this, or you can just write Python scripts or do whatever, do it manually. But the idea is that to take all the data from these different front-end OLTP databases and put it into a universal schema uh, inside your data warehouse. So for example, let's say you have your front-end database, one application has, a, you know, they all have different customers' names. Right? But this one has F name for the first name. This one has first underscore name. So you can't just chuck that all into a single database because the database doesn't know that F name equals first name. So this is where you do that cleanup process here in, in, in the ETL world. So this is a very common setup, right? If you're, if you're going to build a startup, you, you typically start with this because you need to get data first. And then once you have a lot of data, then you want to put it into your backend data warehouse. And the idea is that we, we don't want to do analytics on the front end because that's going to slow us down or slow down our transactions. So we can put this into a backend data warehouse. So this is what we're focusing on today. How do we actually do this? So I use the term OLAP, uh, online analytical processing. Sometimes you'll see, see these types of systems referred to as a data warehouse, or more traditionally, sometimes they're called decision support systems, DSS. And again, the idea is that these are applications we're going to write on our backend da data warehouse that is going to analyze the data we have that we've collected from the OTP side, extrapolate new information, and then guide our decision-making processes for, for the business, for the organization, or for the OTP applications. Right? So very common setup. I, the, the one example I always like to use is like Zynga. Zynga has all their stupid Farmville games up here. Right? These are all OTP databases because for every click in the game, that's another transaction or another update to the database. But then they're going to shove all those clicks into uh, the backend data warehouse, do some analysis on this, at whether you know decision support systems or machine learning, to try to figure out some bullshit how to make you buy more stuff on, on the front end, right? Like the, the, the one example I always heard was, uh, it's the Candy Crush game. So if you play the Candy Crush game, and so you get all these updates on the OTP side, and then if, say you, you get a hard puzzle and you can't beat it, right? And so you put the game down. So they're going to collect all this click streams to see how you played the game. And then they'll learn that, oh, if you come back after not having played the game for like a day because you got frustrated, they make sure you, they give you an easy puzzle that you can solve right away so you get hooked again, right? And then keep playing it. Because they know if they give you a hard puzzle, you'll get frustrated and never come back ever again, right? So that extrapolating that information that, oh, this is how I give you know, the person a, you know, a game that they'll be able to beat, you figure that out on this side and then you push the update to the OTP side. So the, in general, at a high level, there's two different ways you can model uh, a, a database application on a backend data warehouse or analytical database. So you could take the standard schema that you know, you, your application would have. Like Typically, it's usually a tree schema because you have this hierarchy. I have customers. Customers have orders. Orders have I items. Um, but those schemas can be quite messy, and they're not going to be very efficient for analytical queries. So instead, you, you would model your database using either what's called a star schema or a snowflake schema. And sometimes you'll see analytical databases that they'll say, hey, we only support star schemas. You can't do a snowflake schema. And you'll, you'll see, and this is basically a subset of, of this, but you, you'll see why, let's discuss why this actually might be better for some analytics. So a, a very common uh, arrangement would be something like this. So this, this is a star schema. And you have two types of tables in a star schema. You have facts tables and dimension tables. So the middle of the star is the fact table. Think of this as like every, whatever the event you're trying to model, this is where you store all, you know, all the occurrences of them. So if you're like Walmart and your, your, your data warehouse keeps track of every single item that anyone, anyone has ever bought at any Walmart store at any given time, all those items getting scanned at the, cash check, or the, at the checkout counter, that's another event that we've put in our fact table. So this thing is going to be massive, like hundreds of billions of, of records. Same thing Amazon. Every single item that anyone's ever bought on Amazon goes in your, in your fact table. But we're not actually going to store any information about what these items are that someone bought. We're instead going to have foreign key references to our outer dimension tables uh, where they're going to maintain that additional information. Because right? this is things to be massive. We want this to be sort of as, as, as trim as possible because we're going to have uh, billions of rows. 
So we put all the actual metadata in the in the dimension tables. But in a star in a star schema, you can only have one one level of dimension tables out from the center of, of the of the of the star. Right, so there's no additional tables over here that these guys uh, can join with. Right, in this case here, I have a category name, a category description. So I could extract that out, normalize that, store that as another dimension table with another foreign key going from this to this. But under a star schema, you're 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 not allowed to do that. And I'm gonna take a guess why. Yes. Exactly. So you said the time it takes to traverse or join those different tables is going to be expensive. Because again, we're not doing like find all Andy's items. We're saying find all the items that the, you know, the, the state of Pennsylvania has bought within this date range. It's going to be hundreds of millions of rows. So we, so we want to avoid as much as doing as many joins as possible. So a snowflake schema is where you're allowed to do have multiple dimensions outside of it. Right? So again, going back up here, right, I have now can break out my category information. I have a foreign key in the product dimension table. And then I have what is called now a lookup table, uh, which is the things beyond the dimension table, where I have that uh, normalized information as the output. And as I said, a, some database systems, some OLAP systems will say explicitly, you can't have lookup tables. You can't have multiple levels beyond the, the first dimension table. So the, the, the main sort of two issues in this world, as she sort of said, all, all one of them is performance. The other one's actually going to be uh, the, the integrity of the data that, that we're storing. Again, so going back here, if I, if I co collapse down my lookup table into a single dimension table, well, I'm going to be repeating the category name over and over again. So now if the category name changes, I need to make sure in my application code that I go update all the records that have that same category name so that everything's in sync. If I'm normalized out like this in the Snowflake schema, I don't have that problem because I only have one entry for the category. Right? So if you do a star schema, then there's extra work that you have to do in your application to make sure that uh, your, your denormalized tables are, are consistent. You're now actually potentially storing more, more redundant information that's unnecessary, and so your, the size of your database could be larger. It's not that big of a deal because, again, the fact table is, is, the, main, is the main juggernaut in, 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 this, in this model, um, and we will have ways to compress that down. So the, the storage overhead of, of denormalized tables is not that big of a deal. It's more the integrity stuff that's more important. And then as she said, the, the complexity of the queries with a star schema are going to be uh, significantly less than the complexity of the queries in a snowflake schema because there's only so many joins I could possibly do. I, I only have to go sort of one level deep. And as we talked about when we talked about query optimization, the having more tables to join against just makes everything super harder when we have to figure out the join ordering. And so by restricting ourselves to a star schema, we may end up finding a, the optimal plan, whereas the Snowflake schema, we, we may not be able to. So again, when you go out in the real world, if you come across data warehouses, you're likely to see either of these two approaches because they're, they're, they're better for analytics. And this, this distinction between the, the dimension table and the fact table will come up when we start talking about doing joins because we need to decide how we're going to move data between nodes if, our, if we can't do any local joins at, on our machines. OK? All right, so let's talk about the problem we're trying to solve today. And I've, I've already sort of uh, briefly just mentioned just now. So our query shows up in a master node that wants to do a join on RNS. And let's say that the two tables R and S are just split across these different partitions on these different nodes uniformly. So what's the stupidest way for me to execute this query in this setup? Yes? Copy all the tables back. Exactly, right. The dumbest thing I could do, and it would work, it would still be correct, is that I, I know I need touch data at partitions two, three, and four. And so I just copy them in their entirety up into the, the node where partition one is. Now all my data is local. I do my join and spit back the result. Why is that stupid? Yes? You may not need all of the data. He says you may not need all the data. Potentially, yes, but it's even, it's even stupider. Yes? You're not like, doing any computation on any of the other nodes. Absolutely, yeah. You're not doing any computation on the other nodes. Like, it, this defeats the whole purpose of having a distributed database. Right, think about what I did. I bought a bunch of machines, 
I partition my data, my table across these machines, but then my query shows up and I just copy things back over to, to the single machine anyway. So I would have been better off just buying this one machine and doing the join there. Right? So this is the problem we're trying to solve today. We're trying to say, all right, if a query shows up and it wants to do a join, we need to access data that's split now across multiple resources. How do we actually, how do we actually do this efficiently? What do, we, what do we need to be mindful of when we decide whether we move data or copy data or push the query or pull the, you know, pull the results? Right? These are all the design choices we, we have to deal with it today. This also assumes in this example that my database can, can fit in a single node. Right? Again, think of like the Walmart database. It's whatever, hundreds of petabytes. It's not going to fit on a single machine. So we're going to have to run a distributed environment in order to get any, any work done. OLTP, it's not an issue. Because again, in OLTP, I'm only touching Andy's data. Andy's data is maybe a couple hundreds of kilobytes or megabytes. Right? It's not, I can easily fit that on a single box and do all my transactions on that one box. In analytics, I'm trying to touch the entire table or large portions of the table. I'm not going to be able to do everything on a single node. So today our focus is going to be on first discussing the execution models we, we have in a distributed uh, database system for analytics. We've already briefly touched on this a little bit in the first lecture, but now we'll talk about it more, more concretely and see why it matters. Then we'll briefly talk about the, the issues doing query planning. Then we'll talk about how we do distributed joins. The spoiler would be that all the algorithms we talked about early in the semester are still, still germane. We still do them. There's no magic distributed join that doesn't exist on a single node. Uh, it's just the question is, again, where do we move data or where do we, where do we move the computation? And then I'll finish up with sort of a quick smattering of uh, what the sort of state of the art of cloud databases look like uh, in the world today. Um, and just, you know, just, it'll, you'll, again, you'll see how just because it's in the cloud doesn't mean we still don't care about all the things we talked about the entire semester. Okay? All right, so as I said, I briefly touched about this first issue for the execution model uh, when we talked about the sort of introduction to distributed databases. But the two, two approaches we have to execute a query are either a push versus a pull. So with a push, the idea is that we want to send the, the query or the portion of the query, like the, a plan fragment, to the location of where the data is, is located. Then run that portion of the query at that local data, and then now just send, send back the result to whoever asked for it, like the, 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 the home node or the base node that's coordinating the query. And the idea here is that we want to, just as we would, would do projection pushdown or uh, predicate pushdown on a single node system, we want to filter out and remove as much useless data as early as possible before we send anything over the network. So if we can send a portion of the query to where the data is, is, is located, crunch on it there, do some early filtering, and then when we transmit the data back to another node, we're not just blindly copying all the data that the node has, we're just limiting it to the subset of, of that, that we actually need for this particular query. Now, we'll see in a second, the lines get blurred in a shared disk system, whether you're doing one versus another, because in a shared disk system, disk system, in general, you can't do any filtering because it's just, a, it's just you know read and write a single page. You can't do anything special. Um, but for shared disk systems, again, the lines are blurred. The other approach is to pull the data to the query, which is what a shared disk system normally would do, uh, where we grab whatever the data we need for actually this query. We recognize based on uh, the query plan, you know, these are the pages I want to access. We pull the data out, make a copy of it, transmit it over the network, bring it to the node where our query is located. Then we can then process it and crunch on it. And of course, again, the issue here is that in an analytical system, the, the amount of data, the size of the data relative to the size of the query is going to be quite, quite stark or quite different. Like a query, say it's just a SQL query, a couple kilobytes. The most I've ever heard from like Google or, 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 or Facebook is that sometimes they have queries that are like, like the SQL text itself is like 10 megabytes. Right? That's a, that's a large-ass query, but still, that compared to like reading a terabyte of data, it's nothing. So the thing we have to be mindful of, whether you want to do one versus the other, is you know, where is the data located, how can I access it, and is my query going to be larger or smaller in size to transmit over the network than the data I'm trying to access? And in analytics, it's, it's always the case that the, the data you're trying to crunch on is larger. So let's see this in the context of, of, of a shared nothing system. So shared nothing systems are typically push data to uh, push the query to the node. 
So my query shows up to this node here. It's in charge of coordinating uh, with the other node to process, to process the join. So we're going to do our query planner uh, on, on, say, on this node. And we had to recognize, oh, we need to access the, the ID field for the RNS tables. And I know that this node down here has a, 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 a partition that I want to access. So I'll just send information. I'll send the query plan fragment down to this guy and say, hey, I know you have this data between 101 and 200. Crunch this join and then send me back the result. And the node up above is, is responsible for taking the result uh, that this guy sent plus its local result, combining them together to then produce a single result back to the application. So again, we have this transparency issue or transparency guarantee where the application doesn't know, doesn't care where the query actually executed as long as it gets back a single result. So in a shared nothing system, it's quite obvious that you'd want to do uh, push the query to the data, right? Because this makes no sense for us to actually have to copy this data up and process it there. It's just better just to send the query, do the, the crunching locally. For this example, we'll see some scenarios where maybe you do want to do, do some copying. Yes? Like if S itself is distributed, then what? Your question is, what if, if S is distributed as well, then what? Well, in this case here, it, it is distributed. I'm just saying, like, it, it's partitioned, but it's partitioned. We'll come to your, your question later on. Like, because you may need to join it with some other partition also, right? Correct. We'll, we'll come to that later. In this simple example, assume that R and S are both partitioned on ID. The ranges of the values at this partition are exactly the same. So therefore, I know when I'm doing a join at this node, I don't need to look at any other, other partition in my cluster. Everything I need to have a computer node for a single tuple in R is located here. If you're joining on the partition key. I'm yeah, exactly right. I'm joining on the partition key. We'll see those scenarios in a second. Yes. Question. Um, how often, so the scenario you're starting here, where like, you can assume that you're not going to join with any other tables? Her question is in my example here, my tables are partitioned on my join key, which is the best case scenario. How often does that happen? Usually for the fact table, pretty often, right? Like, I would say it's pretty common. Um, I mean, think about it, in, 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 like in a real system. Like, so I want to partition, I, I partitioned on user IDs. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the fact table could say, here's this, this person bought this item. And so, and so, so a bad example. So say I want to do, do a join between like here's here's the user IDs and here's all their items that they bought and then here's the session of how they visited the web page to you know, figure out what items I looked at before I bought something and you want to try to figure out to learn like oh if they go look at these bunch of items then they're more likely to buy something and so in that case the user ID would be the partition key and that would work out nicely so it's not always the case but I would say it's common enough but we'll see in a second how we handle the case where it's not this like this the main thing I'm emphasizing here is where we can push the query to, to the data, uh, and that's going to be better for us because this, this data is going to be larger than, than this guy here. Plus, we also get the, the additional benefit of that we parallelize the computation because now the top node doesn't have to do all the join. This guy can do the join, you know, portion of the join, and this guy can do the other portion of the join, and we just combine it together. And the combined part is cheaper. It's, ch it's cheap relative to the join cost. So the other approach is to pull the data to the query. And again, this is what I'm saying in a shared disk system, the lines are blurred. So we send our query to this node here. Uh, this node would recognize that we've logically partitioned the data such that this node down here is responsible for this range. That node is, is responsible for that range. So then they then go to the, the shared disk, go access those pages, pull back the results, or so pull back the, the, the pages they need. Then they compute their local join and then this guy shows up, shows up the result to the other one. So again, this step here would be uh, pull the data to the query. Because I'm just blindly asking for pages where it's located here, and I have to copy it over here. But then certainly this part here was push the query to the data, because this guy was able to do, you know, compute the join locally and send the result up. So would you say that this is a pull versus a push? Again, it's both. We'll see it. We'll, uh, I don't think I have a slide about this, but 
the cloud vendors are recognizing that having uh, dumb disks, if you want to call it that, uh, in these shared disk databases is a bad idea because again, I'm just always copying this page without checking to see whether I actually need any of the data on the page. I just know that I think I need to look at it. So I just say, hey, go get me this page. On like Amazon S3, they now have a filter command where you actually can do predicate pushdown. And you can, when you say, go get this page, you can also say like, oh, but also check this filter for me to see whether everything actually matches inside the page. And if yes, then send it to me. If no, then don't, right? So again, that's pushing the query to the data. So again, the, the lines are blurred. Okay. So one thing we, we talk about though, is that I said that last class we made a big deal about if we have a transaction commit and it touches multiple nodes, I want to make sure that everyone agrees that all the nodes have to agree that this transaction is allowed to commit before we tell the outside world that it committed, right? Because we're modifying the database. We don't want to lose any changes. But in an OLAP database, we're just doing read-only queries. Um, so we're not really worried about updating the state of the database on multiple locations and keeping those in sync. But now we have to deal with the case where a node could crash while we're processing the query, and we have to figure out how, how to handle that. So the important thing to understand is that when we go request data from another machine or, or the shared disk, and it, we, get, we get the copy of that data when we receive that, that's going to get stored in the buffer pool, just like any other data we have uh, that we read from disk. But it's stored in like a temporary, uh, temporary uh, buffer space, meaning it could get paged to disk because we run out of space. But if we crash or restart the system and come back, all that temporary disk space just gets blown away because the the query or the transaction that was or sorry the query that was uh, that was running that needed that data is now gone because I crashed, and so I don't need to persist anything. So these OLAP queries for really large databases can take a long time. It's not unheard of to have queries that could take hours. Uh, I've also heard of queries that take days. Um, for column stores, it's gotten much better, but back in the old days, it was certainly uh, very common for like a query to take days. Like you, want, you run your reports once a month and it takes like a week to run it. So if we have this long running query and our node crashes, what should we do? It's not a correctness issue because we weren't updating anything. But ideally, it'd be nice maybe that we may not have to restart the whole thing from scratch if it's going to take days. So the, the design decision that most share nothing distributed databases make is that they're not going to actually support query fault tolerance. Meaning if your long running query crashes, if a node crashes during, while your query is running, unless there's a replica that has the data you need, uh, that could you know, fill in some missing piece, depending on where you are in the query plan, they're just going to abort the query and throw back an error and, and tell you to restart it. I'm going to take a guess why they make this decision. It's expensive, right? I'm running a long running query. It starts generating uh, a bunch of intermediate results. And now I've got to make sure I, I flush them all to write them out the disk and make sure there's durable across replicas in case that there's a crash that's going to make your query run a lot slower because the disk is super slow. So in the sort of, in the sort of traditional data warehouse world, they would say, oh, you just paid me $10 million to, to, for this very expensive database system software. I assume you're not running on machines you found at, at Goodwill. Right? I assume you're buying on high-end hardware. So the likely that, hard, that high-end hardware is going to have a catastrophic failure at where it, you know, it's going to crash in the middle of a query is going to be low. So therefore, I'd rather not pay the penalty of of taking snapshots or writing the enemy results out the disk as I run. So in general, most OLAP systems are going to, if a query, if a node crashes during, during query execution, and let's say it's not just reading from, from a disk where you have copies of, like it's, it's some, it's the middle bar of the query where you have enemy results, then you say the query fails. It's when Hadoop came out in the mid 2000s, they were actually taking snapshots. They were actually taking, you know, writing at every step of a query plan, writing that out the disk, but that made it super slow, right? Because back in the old days when, when, even still now, but like when Google was building MapReduce, they talked about running on, you know, cheap hardware, where if you're running a thousand node uh, cluster and your query's running across a thousand nodes, the likelihood that any node's going to crash during that time is pretty high. So in their world, they would rather take the snapshots to avoid this. Yes? 
But saying one no fails, it means no class and no, no longer respond, or one transaction fails. No, there, okay, we're not talking about transactions here. No transactions. We're talking read only queries, analytical queries. Right? So if, if it says, if, Say from last class, we're talking about transactional distributed, distributed databases support transactions. If a node fails that while we're executing a transaction, we just abort that transaction. Because who cares? So that transaction what ran for 50 milliseconds? Who cares? If now I have an analytical query that's gonna take days to run, if it take if it takes five days to run and I crash on the fourth day, then I just wasted four days of work. Some people would get actually pissed about that, because now you gotta, you know, start it up and run, run all over again. And so you could take a snapshot. Some systems allow you to take snapshots as you run the query. At the, like, at, as the output of one query plan as it gets fed into the next operator, I'll just write all that out to disk as well so that if I crash at that point, I can bring it back. There's ways to turn that on, but by default, most systems do not because they don't want to pay that performance penalty overhead. So again, on a, on a shared disk system, it's easy, to, it's easy to visualize. And we're doing that same join. We send the plan family down here. And then as it computes the join result, it's going to write that out to the shared disk. There's some notification to a coordinator to say, hey, if, if you're looking for this join result, uh, here's where to go get it on the shared disk. And that way, if this guy crashes and goes away, this guy knows he can just pull it from, from there and not worry about you know, having to recompute anything. So, so th th again, this is an important design decision that the distributed databases are going to make. They're, they're, they're not going to provide you what sometimes called query resiliency or fault tolerance while the query executes, they have, they'll maybe restart the query for you, but they're not going to try to pick up where, where, where a node was running uh, at the moment of the crash. OK? All right, so the other thing we've got to worry about now is also how to do query planning. So we have all the same issues that we had before, join order rings, how to do predicate pushdowns, early projections, all those same decisions we had to do. On a single node system, we still have to do in a distributed system. But now we have a sort of an extra level of planning where we need to reason about where our data is located, how it's partitioned or replicated, and now account for the network communication cost uh, for our algorithms. Right? Again, this will make more sense in a second when we talk about the different scenarios, but like the join ordering still matters. But now it's also like, all right, well, I need it. Should I join these two tables first because they're on the same node and partition the same way, and therefore that can be really fast, even though if I was on a single node, I may not want to join those two tables first. So that just gets now included in your cost model to help you, help you make a decision about, again, what's the right query plan, the most optimal query plan for the, for the system. Again, just as I said before, doing query optimization on a single node is hard. This is just even harder. Okay, and like we, uh, you know, sometimes you can make a decision on a single node and centralized location. Sometimes you can make it in, in a distribute across all the nodes. But now again, you have this, you have to make sure all your statistics and all your nodes are updated as much as possible to help you make decisions about what the best plan could be. It's just everything's just much harder when it's distributed. But now, assuming we have now a, a query plan. What do we actually want to send to our different nodes that are, that are going to participate in executing a join query? So there's two approaches. One is we could actually send the physical plan or, or plan fragment uh, to, to the node for it to execute um, by just taking the query plan that we've generated on, you know, on the base node or the home node and then carving it up to say, well, I know this portion of the query plan needs to execute on this, this node. This other portion of the query plan needs to execute on that node. You distribute those physical operators to the, the other nodes. They just take them and immediately just execute them without reasoning about whether that's the best thing to do for their local data, and then sending back the results. So as far as I know, most, uh, most distributed databases that are doing analytics do this first approach. Well, they generate, they run the query plan through an optimizer once, generate a global plan for the entire cluster for the query, then carve it up into to plan fragments and divide it up. Another approach is to actually take the SQL query that came in and then rewrite it to have it be on a per partition basis, have a SQL query for each individual partition, and then send that out. Then when the, when the, the node that that, where the partition is located gets that SQL query, then it runs it through its own query optimizer to generate the physical plan that it wants to execute. 
And the idea here is that if we can assume that the if we did a global plan on a single node, the statistics and information about what's, what's best at each partition is not going to be up to date or, or, you know, or fresh. And therefore, rather than me trying to reason at my home node what the best thing to do at this other node, I'll just say to this other node, hey, I think you need to execute this query, or I need you to execute this query for me. And then that, that node can then do all the local optimization and all, all local planning uh, when that SQL query arrives. So again, look at an example here. So this is my query like this. And so I could, in this case, there's, you know, there's, there's no join order. Uh, could, well, it's either RS or SR. But I just say, all right, well, I need to execute the query. I need such data at these three partitions. So I'll rewrite my SQL statement to now include a where clause that says, here's the, here's the portion of the data you need to look at, which matches what the partition key is, or the partition range is. Then the node gets, gets this, each, each node gets these individual query plans, run it through its own optimizer, and then it can decide, oh, based on the data I have here, is it better to join R than S or S than R? Should I do a hash join? Should I do a sort merge join? I can make a local decision here because I have the best view of what's, what data I'm actually storing. Whereas the home node, again, could be out of date. So the only database system that, actually, that I'm aware that actually does something like this is, is MemSQL. Everybody, uh, everybody else sends the physical plan. Um, I don't, I mean, to me, this seems convincing that you could do this. I think you still have to make a higher level decision of the possible join order at, you know, if you have multiple tables, more than two, like if I have R, S, and T, should I join R and S or T and S first? Like, I think there is some information there that you may have to reason about at the upper level. But when it comes time for the local uh, node to make this decision, you know, every, it doesn't, worry about communicating with anybody else. I'm not saying one is better than another. I think this has interesting uh, implications that have not been explored in the research. Okay. So now we want to talk about joins. Again, joins are the most expensive, or most, most important thing you have to do in a single node database and just, you know, also in a, in a, in a distributed database. For analytical workloads, the large portion of the time that the, the system is gonna spend executing a query where I'd be reading data from disk or doing, doing a join. And as we said, reading from data from disk, there's, you know, there's, there are some methods you can do to speed that up, but it, at the end of the day, you're usually bound on how fast you can get things off, off of the, the, the physical device. But for joins, we can, we can be a bit, bit smarter about things. So as I showed in the first ex very first example, the easiest way to do a, a join is just get all the data we need to do our join, put them on a single node, and run our join algorithm. But as I said, you lose all the extra parallelism and extra resources you have by dividing the data across multiple nodes. You lose all those benefits, and you also, you know, you, you may not be able to actually put everything in memory to run things fast. So there's gonna be four different approaches to actually how, to, how, to, how we actually, or four different scenarios you need to handle when we wanna do a distributed join. And again, a distributed join is, is going to be the exact same way we would do a join on a single node system, but the idea is that we need to figure out how to get the data we want to join together on a, on a, on a, on a node. It could be one node, it could be multiple nodes, such that we can do a join locally without having to coordinate with any other node while we're doing the join. So when we do that local join, it's all the same algorithms, the sort merge join, nested loop join, the hash join that we talked about before, all the same optimizations apply. It's the step you have to deal with before you do that join of how to get the data uh, to a node that, that, that's gonna need it. So again, we're gonna talk about four different scenarios. These have already sort of come up in, in our early examples uh, and we'll, we'll see how we actually wanna handle them. And again, the, the, the main takeaway is that there's no magic here that we can actually do. There's no magic again distributed join algorithm that's gonna perform so much better than a, a single node one. It's all about how to get the data to where it needs to be. All right, so the best case scenario would be one where the, the table is, one of the tables we're joining is partitioned on the join key. And then the other table is, is, is replicated in its entirety at every single node. So in this case here, the R table is, is partitioned on the, on the ID, its ID field, which is in our join clause. And then the S table is replicated at every node. Again, this could be the fact table, this could be the dimension table. Now, this is going to be small enough where we could split it up or 
small enough where we can replicate it on, on every single machine. So in this case here, again, all we need to do is have every single node do a local join to produce the, resu the join result for the data that it has you know, stored in its, in its local storage. And then we just need to transmit the, the output of, one, of, of, of join on one node to some centralized location so that we can combine the results and produce a single, single answer to our application. All right, so again, this is the best case scenario because this transfer to get the, the join result from this node to that node is unavoidable. We have to do it. But when we actually did the join, we didn't need to coordinate or communicate with any other node because everything we needed was local to us. So this gives us the benefit of a distributed database because now we can run this join in parallel on every single node without any coordination. And then everyone just sends the result back to the, the, the head node. The next best case scenario is where the both of the keys are partitioned, uh, both of the tables are partitioned on the join key. Again, in this case here, the again the SID on the, the last slide, it was partitioned on um, sorry, it was replicated. This one is partitioned on the ID field, and the range that's in this in this partition is the same as, as the range of sorry, the range of the partition for S is the same as the range for partition on R. So again, just like before, we compute our local join. It could be a hash join, it could be a nested loop, it could be sort merge, it doesn't matter. And then this guy transmits the result to this other node where we combine it together. Yes? So in this partitioning thing, like, isn't it necessary that R and S are equally distributed according to the partition key? That it may happen that R has most records in 1 to 100 and S has all of its records in like 2 uh, 200 to 200. So his question, his question is about data skew. So, in this example here, I'm showing you that the ranges are the same, 1 to 100, and 1 to 1 to 200, but it doesn't necessarily tell you how many tuples exist in this range for this partition. So, like, say this ID is the primary key for R, so there's exactly 100 tuples for R, but say this is, ID is not the primary key for, I, for, for S, I could have a billion entries within this range, and then a billion entries for that range. How do I handle that? Well, in that case, you've not, you would not want to have the same range as the ID field. So in that case, you will have to shuffle some data around, which we'll talk about in a second. This best case scenario, these are uniform, uniformly distributed, exact same range. I don't need to coordinate. Yeah, it sure, it doesn't happen. I, I agree with you. It won't happen in real world. I'm saying best case or worst case scenario. And we'll see how to handle as things get worse. All right, so... So related to him, so, so the next issue is going to be, let's say that one of our tables is not partitioned on the, the same attribute that we want to join on. So in this case here, S is partitioned on the value field. Uh, so in this case, we can't compute our local join because for every single value of, of RID here, I don't know whether it's, it's you know, a, a matching tuple will exist on my local partition. There may be one over here with the same ID. So in this one, in this case, this is called a broadcast join, and the basic idea is that you copy the the portion of the table that's missing from uh, from each partition to every other partition, so that now this node has a complete copy of of the table, and then now you just compute your local join and then send the result over to the other guy. Again, this assumes that S is, is small enough that it could you know, reside in memory or not, take up, not overwhelm this machine or this node here. If you try to copy everything here, uh, right? The, the broadcast means that you're basically generating every node will end up with a replicated copy of, of the table. Sometimes you'll see it referred to as a broadcast hash join or broadcast, broadcast sort merge join. It just means they're doing this initial step where they transmit the data across to, to different nodes so that everyone has a complete copy, and then you do the join. The last scenario is the absolute worst case scenario, is where both tables are not partitioned at all on our join key, and now we need, we need to, to reorganize the, the layout of the data to, so that we can compute our join more, more efficiently. So this will be called a shuffle join, or sh shuffle hash join. So basically, we recognize that, oh, well, we really want things to be partitioned on the ID field. So let me just start copying the data that I need from these two tables to these two different nodes. If this has to spill to disk, I run out of space. 
that's unavoidable. Uh, so we just go ahead and do that. And then once I know I have everything partitioned the way I want it partitioned, then I can keep my local join and generate the result. Yes? What? So his question is, when the space is limited, what can you do? So the point I'm trying to make here is like, uh, think about what you'd end up doing here, right? So I, I have to now make another copy of R on, on, you know, and store it on this node. And so if it doesn't fit in memory, just as I said, like it's, it's, it, it gets spilled as a temporary result for the query, could get spilled to disk. That's unavoidable, right? But the, 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 the more important thing is that now when I compute the join, I want that to be fast as possible because that's the most expensive thing. So by copying the data around, when I do the join, it, the, everything is partitioned nicely the way that I want it, and it's, and it's more efficient. And we, and we always assume that the disk is enough. We, we, his question is, do we always assume that the disk is enough? For our class, yes. In the real world, no. Uh, what will happen is the database system recognizes that if I get to here and I can't copy any more data to this node here, the query would fail. You just, you just you say I run out of swap space or temp space and you, you throw an error and the query fails. Um, and actually related to his question about, about the distribution of data, if say it was partitioned on the ID field, but the, the, the distribution was highly skewed such that most of the data was on this node, for S instead of that node, I can still again do this reshuffling to, to realign my data, maybe move some data from R and S over here so that things evenly get balanced. It's still, it's still called a shuffle process. Question? Uh, so I was wondering how does that work in practice? How does, how does that work in practice? Sorry. Yeah, because like if, for example, you have, so you think uh, it's, it's not such an ID, you have like some of the um, nodes in an ID there, right? Yes. Your question, how, how, do you, how do you manage what, sorry? Um, so, for example, if like, some of the data is repeated, you don't want to send both like, uh, twice the data, right? So, how do you manage like, at the beginning, like, what to do? Her question is, how do I make a decision about what data to send? Because if, if things are replicated, I don't want to waste, you know, waste network transmission of sending data that's, that's, that I don't need to send. You know everything ahead of time, right? SQL is declarative. We know what the query is. We know what data you're trying to access. We then look in our system catalog. Our system catalog is going to tell us how this data is actually partitioned. We know this ahead of time. So the query planner can make a decision. Oh, well, this data is partitioned this way, and it's this size, and it's on this node. So therefore, I need to move or not move or copy here. Don't copy there. I can do all of that ahead of time. It's not like as I'm, as I'm going along, I say, oh, well, yeah, maybe I should copy this. You figure out everything ahead of time. Except for the issue he brought up, where like I ran out of disk space, you know, you just fail. Nothing you can do. And then the the how efficient the the database system is in making those decisions about what to copy or not to copy depends on how good your query optimizer is, which is why people pay a lot of money to have people that work on query optimizers. Uh, Question. The question is, what if the data is sorted on the partition ID beforehand? Uh, partition ID or join ID? Uh, partition ID. So if it's sorted, f for what I'm showing here, who cares? Right? Because what I care about is the locality of the data. I need to join RID on SID. So I want to make sure that when I do that join locally, I have all the data that I need to ever, you know, for, for, you know, to join the outer table with the inner table is at my local node. I, it can't be at some other node that I don't know about, and I could end up with a false negative or false positive. So sorting doesn't matter. Sorting would matter when we, we could make a decision about, do I want to do a cert merge versus hash join? We're like a step above this. We're deciding how do we move data or, or not. Yes? What is actually being like, like swapped? Is it just like the um, join ID and like a record ID associated with it or something? Okay, so the question is, what, what, am, what am I actually transmitting here? And be, to be clear, I'm not swapping this. I should, should have a divider line. So this is the permanent data on this node. It does not go anywhere. I just make extra copies as tempor temporary data to do my join, and then I throw it away when my query is over. So even though I'm shuffling here on ID, the, I'm still going to be, at the end of the day, partition on name and value here. 
this, this, this stays. But then your other question is, what am I actually transmitting? Am I transmitting the whole tuple or am I transmitting the, uh, some, some identifier? Next slide. We'll get to, we'll get to that. Yes. Your question is, on a local node, if the data is not sorted, how do I make sure that there's no duplicates? Duplicates of what? Duplicates. On, for the join? Uh, for, for the party side, you say there should be some... some Aha! Yeah. Is the partition ID the primary key or a unique ID? Uh, my question is, how do you make sure that the primary key uh, is unique? Hold up. The, 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 well, yeah, so, so, so right. you had two questions there. So I think what you're asking is actually, if I have a primary key, then I need to guarantee it's unique. But my, my partition key is not the primary key. How do I make sure that I enforce that? So that, that is a transaction, right? That's not us. We're just doing analytical queries. We assume, we don't, like, we assume that someone else has solved that for us when they stored the data as a part of a transaction. So in your example, if I have a partition key that's not the same as the primary key, then I insert a new record. How do I make sure that's unique? Well, I either need to maintain a sort of centralized index that I can look up and see whether this key does already exist, or I have to broadcast the query to every node to say, hey, I'm about to insert this key. Do you, do you already have a copy of it? I'm saying you could, right? How could that be? I mean, how, I mean, how, could, how could that be? I, here's a node, here's an index. We're building a database. We can do whatever we want, right? We can do this. But the index is not vision for that. Again, like, I don't care about, in this world, for these queries, I'm not enforcing integrity constraints. I'm just running this read query, these analytical queries, to figure out you know, how to compute the join efficiently on a large, a large data corpus. The transactional side, it cares about integrity constraints when you, because you're, you're modifying the state of the database. So you are assuming that the OLAP database only handles read-only data. So everything is read-only? No, no, no. So, so, so going back to my initial example here, Like for this ETL thing. So this thing is like you're bulk loading a bunch of data. Like this is sort of streaming. It's not happening. It's not like all at once, here's a bunch of data. It's like you're streaming incrementally updates from the front end to your back end data warehouse. And the back end data warehouse could choose or not choose to enforce those integrity constraints as it comes in. But it's but it won't be on the critical path of when we execute our queries. Because I'm running a select statement, I'm not checking to see whether my primary key is unique. So now, how you enforce that integrity constraint as you ingest the data into your, your backend data warehouse, well, that's the same thing we talked about in the last class, how to do transactions, because that is a type of transaction. You know, insert something, make sure it's unique. I need to coordinate across multiple nodes if I'm not, everything's not on a single node to, to, to make that check. Does everyone agree that we can go ahead and make this change? So a lot of times in these analytical uh, data warehouses, they will have uh, they will sort of have a separate engine uh, or, a, or a storage area that is designed to do efficient or more, or more efficient updates than what a you know a traditional column store database system would do. If you take the advanced class, we will cover that. We didn't cover that here, right? So again, for our purpose here today, we don't care about enforcing that integrity train. We assume that it is already handled for us. Some database systems, I mean, some data warehouses, they just turn all that crap off. They turn off foreign keys. They turn off uh, unique keys. Your data is a little dirty. Who cares? For analytics. So even if the front end layer, I mean, the RCP database, to handle the duplication, what if they want to update the value? And Right, so this question is, uh, you have your bank account or, or whatever, whatever your, your, your game information, 
you, you, you update your user account on the front end OTP database because that's what that's the users are touching this part and they don't touch the back end data warehouse. They make updates here. That update gets propagated and you want to go update the record here. How does that happen? Advanced class. In general, what I'll say is like you buffer a bunch of changes in a sort of write optimized storage layer or execution engine in the data warehouse and then they periodically merge the change into the data warehouse or into, into like the, the, the main column store tables for the, for the, for the, to do analytics. Different systems do different things. Okay. So, um, all right, any, any other questions about, about this stuff here? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Her question is, I said here that if, if when we go to copy this thing here for this particular query, if we run a disk base and the query crashes, couldn't the query optimizer figure that out ahead of time and say, oh, I'm not going to have a disk base. Let me, let me make sure that, uh, let me, maybe not run it a certain way here. The query optimizers usually do not reason about what are other queries running at the same time. It assumes your query runs in isolation uh, and that it, it can reason about certain things like some, so some systems you can specify how much temporary buffer space or temporary disk space the query is allowed to use. And then if you exceed that, then your query fails and it throws you back, hey, you know, increase this parameter if you want to keep running. Um, so it could potentially figure out at planning time, oh, I'm going to copy over more, more data than I have space for for this particular query and throw an error. Um, but if like your disk physically runs out of, uh, out of space, even though you're not within that, you know, you, you, you haven't exceeded that limit on a per query basis, the query optimizer usually does not think about or cannot reason about what queries are running at the same time. Because that just makes your life harder. Because like I, this query first shows up, I plan it, I say, all right, nothing's running now let me go ahead and, and choose one kind of plan because I'm running by myself, then start running. And then this other query now shows up. I don't want to go back and modify that other query's plan to say, hey, now you're also be running with this other query at the same time. That's way too hard. Uh, so you said the OLAP database doesn't support human import. No, no, no. So, so my comment was that sometimes you see in data warehouses, so the, the, the database system itself could support Scheme uh, enforcing integrity constraints, foreign keys, primary keys, referential integrity constraints, stuff like that. It could support those, but the application developer, the person building the data warehouse, may say, I don't want to pay the penalty to check for foreign keys. Let me turn all that off. Okay. So, does OLAP database support uh, recovery and loading? Right now, you said it doesn't. His question is, I said that in the previous slide uh, that in general, most shared nothing, uh, actually even shared disk, most distributed OLAP databases do not support query fault tolerance or query, query resiliency, where if a query, if a, if a node crashes that's responsible for executing query, halfway through the query execution, they are not able to recover the animated results that that query was had or computed and then pick the query up where it left off. In general, they just kill the whole thing, throw you an error, or maybe restart it silently for you. That has nothing to do with logging and recovery. We absolutely still need logging and recovery, uh, and we still do that. This is, this, is, this is more about while the query is running, do I, can I take snapshots as I go along so that I can pick up, I can pick up midway where the query is running if a node goes down. And, I'm, and the, the statement I made was that, to the best of my knowledge, most distributed OLAP systems do not support that query resiliency because taking the checkpoints, the snapshots of the immediate result is expensive. Logging of what? So lo logging of what? Logging on recovery of the... The query or the, of the database? Uh, the database. We're still, all the fault, all the... The D, the D and acid stuff that we talked about before, we are still doing that. 
we are still making sure that if we ingest data from the outside world to update our database, we don't want to lose that. And so we'll, we'll, they will all provide durability guarantees. Again, I have 100 petabytes at Walmart. They don't want to lose that data, right? And the data system will guarantee that they won't. When you say operation, again, what do you mean? Like the, an update to it or a, re, a, a, a query, like a, like a select query? Let's take this, let's go, let's, let's sit down afterwards, okay? We'll go through this. I, I think there's something you're missing here. Okay. So, to his question about what am I actually sending when I do these distributed joins, am I sending the whole tuple or am I sending, sending, an, sending, sending an identifier? And I would say the answer is that you're sending, at the very least, you're sending the minimum amount of information that you need in order to compute the join and then the worst case scenario, you're sending the entire tuple. And in general, again, the, the, the high end, the good distributed databases that are doing analytics will, will try to minimize that amount of that data that you actually need. And so this particular type of query uh, would be called using what is called a semi-join. A semi-join is like a regular join, but the idea is that we're not really gonna do a join on the, on the, the right table or the inner table we're only going to check to see whether, if we did a join, a tuple would match. So the query optimizer can recognize that it may not need all the all the any it may, may not need any values or attributes or from the columns of the inner table, and therefore it can rewrite the query just to do an existence check and send the minimum amount of information back and forth between nodes to do that semi join rather than copying the entire tuple. Again, like a natural join, you would you would do the join, and then the output would be all the all the combination or the, the the concatenated tuples from the right and the left table. In a semi join, it's just the attributes needed to compute the join from the outer table. So in this case here, say I have a query like this: select RID from uh, from R, doing an outer join on S, and we're just matching on ID, and then and this is a poorly written query because they're basically saying where RID is not null then match up with on S. So if we didn't do a semi-join, we either have to copy S over here or, or, or R over here. Um, again, we're copying the entire tuple, that would be expensive. But we could rewrite this query to be like this, where we just check to see whether there exists a tuple in S that has the same uh, ID as RID. And then if that's true, then we just we'd spit out all our RIDs that match. So in this case here, the only thing I need to send over is just maybe just the RIDs, because that's the bare minimum information I need in order to compute this join. So the some systems like Cloud Arrows and Paula actually has an explicit semi-join uh, keyword you can give it. Uh, otherwise, you can try to fake it with it exists. So the high-end systems can actually try, try to rewrite your query into a semi-join. Again, as part of figuring out what data I need to transmit between, between the different nodes. And it includes that in its cost calculations in the optimizer's cost model to decide how much data am I transmitting between different nodes and is, is one plan better than another. What do you mean by you can fake it with an exit? So like I could have, I could say select RID from our semi-join on SID, explicit SQL that does, that says, hey, you're doing a semi-join, or I can rewrite it as, as this. Most systems you have to do this because they don't have, I don't think semi joins in the SQL standard. Yes? The question is who does, who does this work? In this example here, this is the application programmer. The, the high end enterprise systems that have good query optimizers could figure out how to potentially rewrite this for you. They could, they could do that for you. The question is, is, is the query optimizer another node? Another, like, what do you mean by another node? I know the, the two nodes, but the two nodes. I, I this, this, so this is like a partition. Like you can, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether the query optimizer is running this, this node here or another node. It doesn't matter. To, what we're talking about here. This is just sort of like 
the semantics of the, of the semi-join. So from a relation, relational algebra standpoint, uh, it just looks like this. I'm joining R and S. And then the output, uh, this is the semi-join operator. The output would be just again, the, the AID and BID that I used to compute the join. And nothing from, from the, the inner table. So is this clear? There's a homework question on it. All right. So we have 10 minutes. So as I said, th this is just sort of a crash course on, on crash course on the the main design decisions and issues in uh, we're doing an analytical database. If you're not going to be building a you know analytical database management system, actually working on the internals of the system, you just want to be a user of them. The main issue you're going to deal with is that partition key. How to pick that in such a way that most your 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 joins can operate on a local node without having to do a broadcast or a shuffle. And the, the, the various systems that are out there, mostly the enterprise guys, have tools to help you try to figure these things out for you. Okay? All right, let's talk about cloud databases. So the definition of a cloud, cloud database is a bit nebulous. Uh, no pun intended. The, the, typically what it means is, is some vendor offering you what is called a database as a service, or DBAAS. The idea is that you give Amazon whoever your credit card, and they will say, "Here's your JDBC or Net ODBC connection uh, port number and, and and host name," that you just start shoving queries into it, and you don't worry about how to manage the nodes, you don't worry about how to do backups. They take care of all of that for you. And so I already sort of mentioned this before, but the the in the so major cloud vendors, people that control the whole stack like Amazon, like Google, like Microsoft, the lines between what is a shared disk system versus a shared nothing system is starting to get really blurry because they can push down database logic up, between, up and down the different layers of the system stack in a way that you typically can't do unless you control the hardware yourself. So for example, Amazon has something called Aurora. Aurora is a shared disk version of MySQL and Postgres. But they actually push logic to do transaction management down into the storage layer in, the, in EBS, like at, at the shared disk level. And so now it's not a pure shared disk system anymore. It starts to look a bit more like a shared nothing system. Um, so, all right, so, so I think in the next 10 years, I think the, the cloud systems are going to see the most, you see the most innovation in the cloud systems. And I think it's going to be really interesting what they can kind of do. All right, so I think I've, I've really talked about this. In general, uh, a cloud system could either be a, a managed database or a cloud native database. So a managed database would be just taking an off-the-shelf database that was, system that was written to run on premise on dedicated hardware, and now you're just running this for you as, as a service. Take MySQL, take Postgres, and then just plop it into an EC2 instance, and then have people connect to it. And they don't know and don't care that you're managing EC2 for them, that they could have done that themselves, uh, but you're just providing a service to do all the backup and other management stuff for, for them. So most of the times when you see when you get a cloud database, it's going to be it's going to be the, the first one. Now there are some systems where they'll they'll refer to themselves as being a cloud native data management system, and these are ones where they're designed to explicitly operate in a cloud environment, and typically they're going to be a shared disk architecture because they don't want to actually have to build, you know, replicate EBS or S3. So they'll build on top of the existing storage uh, infrastructure that these cloud vendors provide you, and they're providing the, the compute layer on top of it. You know, you still have to do query planning, you still have to do all the fault tolerance stuff we talked about before, but they don't worry about actually how to, you know, persist things to disk. They just let the cloud vendor provide that for you. So there is now also a new class of systems that label themselves as being serverless. Yes. Yeah, the question is what is what is like what is what is truly the difference here? So this would be a managed database would be just again, using MySQL as an example. I take MySQL, I just run it without making any changes to it. I run it in a container or I run it in a in a in a VM, and it's the same software that I would run on my local machine, but just now I'm running it in, in a you know in a cloud for you. Right? And then all and then the 
the service provider will then also do the backups and recovery and all the other stuff for you. This would be like, I'm building a new database system from scratch, or I take an existing one and I make heavy changes to it to be designed to work in a, in a, in a cloud environment. So up here, if I'm running my SQL, my SQL doesn't know anything about S3. It doesn't know anything about the performance implications of you know, reading from EBS and things like that. It just I have a disk, it has these properties. This would be like, oh, I've designed the system explicitly to work on S3. S3 provides me these guarantees, provides me these properties. That information now permeates all throughout the system. My, my query optimizer's cost model can then reason about, you know, what's the speed of writing S3 or what, you know, what can you do in S3 you can't do on EBS, stuff like that. All right, so there's this, the, the buzzword going around now is serverless. Uh, so of course there's serverless databases. And so it's the same, everything's the same that we talked about before. It's just that the idea is that when your machine goes idle, your, your database connection goes idle because your application is no longer sending queries, they will try to then deprovision or have you, you know, not pay for hardware that you're not actually using. So let's say that I have, again, a managed database system. I have a single node. It's running my SQL. And so I pay for, I pay for the instance. I pay for the storage. And I, I have to provision it to be running all the time. So my application sends queries to this guy and, you know, and gets results and comes back. But now if my, if my application goes to sleep or walks away, or goes to the bathroom, does whatever, uh, then I'm paying for these resources I'm not actually using, right? Because I have to provision the hardware. I have to provision the EC2 instance. I have to provision the EBS storage, right? So I'm paying for this stuff to run and not actually do anything. So the idea with a serverless database is it's almost always a shared disk architecture is that I can do my, all my queries that I had before, but now when I go to sleep, I decommission the compute side of things. This goes away, but before I do, I basically take a snapshot of what pages are in my buffer pool. I take a checkpoint, then record all the page IDs of what's in my buffer pool, write that out the shared disk, then kill off my compute node. And so now the only thing I'm paying for is storage. Just paying for my database to rest at idle on disk. And then if I ever wake up and come back and execute a query, the very first thing I'm going to do is say, all right, well, before I shut down the last time, what was in my buffer pool? And got to try to fetch that in and, and make it as if I was still running all the time. So this is one way to do it. If you assume that the, there's only one customer running on a single node, uh, another common setup would be you run multiple customers or multiple tenants on a single node. And then you just recognize that this customer has not sent me a query in a while. And then I write out this buffer for pull page contents out to disk before. Yes? What's the advantage of uh, writing and maintaining the buffer pool as opposed to just like building the buffer pool starting with the buffer pool? So his question is, why am I doing this extra step? Why am I actually writing the buffer page contents out to disk before, you know, why do I care about this? Because you want to make it as if, like the, the most expensive thing is patching things from disk. So ideally, I want to have, you know, my query, the next query shows up a minute later, I don't want to have everything all now evicted from my buffer pool, and I have to pay this big upfront cost of, of, of warming all my data and bringing it into memory. So, so you, you record all this information so that when you come back again a minute later, it looks like the thing was still running, and you don't, like, you still pay the penalty because you, you have to fetch it in, but you don't have to wait to, like, fetch everything in. You try to maybe prefetch some stuff. It's just pre yeah, pre-warming. It's pre-warming the cache. Yeah, every database system does this. When you call shutdown, do like a correct shutdown. They're they're already doing this. So that means you don't write buffer pool page table in the storage. It's still work, right? Start a new machine. Correct. So 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 his question is, if I don't do this step, will this still work? Yeah, it'll be correct, but it'll be slow, right? This is this is just an optimization to to again warm the cache. You know, think of it like we're just storing the the con we're just storing the page IDs we had in the buffer pool at the time we at the moment we did a shutdown. So then the first query shows up, and and then say the first query says go give me page one two three, and it says oh I also had four five six seven eight nine also in there let me go fetch them and fetch them all in. Yes. This question her question is how does it relate to being stateless as in the serverless. Uh, it's usually what people mean by serverless, it's stateless. Okay. 
but it's, it is and it isn't, right? So it, it, it's serverless from, from the perspective of the end user. Meaning like, I don't have to say, provision me this machine. So a lot of the cloud vendors, if they're not doing a serverless architecture, you basically say, I want, to be, I, want, you know, I want to pay for this dedicated resources to be available for me at all time. If you're not using them, they're still charging you. They're happy, right? But if my, I, mean, I have one query a minute, I don't, want to, you know, I don't want to provision a whole machine just to send, you know, execute 60 queries an hour. Whereas in this architecture, I could still have my database, still as if it was running all the time, but I'm not paying that penalty. So I pay on a, I pay on a per query basis plus whatever I'm storing over here. So the, the main vendors that are in this space would be Amazon has a, a serverless version of MySQL, and then uh, FaunaDB is a, is a separate database startup that does. So, so Amazon will try to, all these guys are doing not exactly this where you kill the machine, they're just recognizing this customer has not sent a query while, and, and, and then they, they write everything up to disk. Um, so Azure can do this, and then Google, I think it's, um, these icons are so useless because it's like doesn't say the name. I don't know exactly what this is. I think it's the Google Firestore. So not Spanner, not the BigQuery stuff. It's only for Firestore. All right, so another interesting thing about this is that you could potentially build a database system without having to write every piece of the system yourself. So uh, there's enough open source software that's out there now or services that are out there. You can cobble a bunch of these things together and make a new cloud database without having to write everything from scratch. So we've already talked about, like, as I said, her question was, what is a cloud native database? Well, it's one where you assume that you can write, you know, you, the software is written to assume you're writing to S3 and you take those, its guarantees or performance implications into, into design. So that would be sort of one example where you don't have to write the, you know, disk manager, you just let S3 handle that for you. You may not have to write your catalogs, Right? You can get metadata service, get metadata as a service through, through these bunch of uh, different types of software. You may not have to manage your cluster. You can rely on, on Kubernetes or Yarn or, or these other tools that the vendors have to handle all that for you. And then you may not actually even have to build your own query optimizer. So there actually are some open source uh, sort of optimizers as a service where it runs on a separate node. You just feed it a bunch of XML or JSON metadata to say, here's what my data looks like, here's what my query plan looks like. And then the separate machine would then crunch on it and spit out a, uh, a, you know, a potentially optimized plan for you. I don't know how good these things are actually are. Uh, I have, there hasn't been any study to actually to evaluate them yet. We looked at Orca when we were building our system and we passed on it because at the time the documentation was terrible. Um, CalSite's written in Java, so that was a non-starter for us as well. All right, the last thing I want to briefly talk about is uh, file formats. So pretty much until very recently, every single database management system always had their own proprietary binary file format. Meaning like MySQL writes a bunch of files to disk, you can't read those files into Oracle, because or, Oracle has its own file format. Can you do the same thing when you built, when you, when you built your projects on BusTub, BusTub has its own page formats and that can't be read by anybody else. So this is problematic now if you're, in, if you're in a cloud environment where you have a bunch of different services that may want to share data. Like I have a bunch of data I want to generate from my OLTB databases, and maybe I want to run that data through Spark or run that data through, through Vertica or some other distributed database. So the, right now, if, if everything's based on a proprietary format, the only way you can get data out from one system and put it to another system is to make copies and put it into one of these sort of human-readable, text-readable formats. And so now instead is that there's these open source binary formats that a bunch of cloud vendors or, and, and distributed databases or, or, or data science ecosystem tools are now supporting so that I could just write out to S3 or EBS or my distributed file system a bunch of these files in this format that my, that my database system generated and then I could suck them in and read them into another database without having to do any deserialization or conversion. So some of these you may have heard of, uh, but these are just, these are sort of the main ones. Uh, Parquet and Orca are probably the two most common ones. Parquet came out of Cloudera and Twitter, and Orca came out of uh, Hive. And again, think of these are like binary column store formats that are not tied to any one specific database system. Like it's an open specification that anybody can modify their database system or modify their application to read this data natively. Carbon Data is a newer one, actually 2016-ish, I think. Uh, that's like Orc and Parquet that came out of uh, Huawei in China. 
Iceberg is another new one from, uh, from Netflix that I was just notified recently by somebody. Uh, I haven't looked in too much into it yet, but they claim that they can support schema evolution. Like I can do change columns, and, uh, you know, change names, change column types in a way that these other guys can. These other guys are, are read-only. Like I create the file and then I freeze it and then I can't go back and change it. HD5 is not typically used in, in cloud systems or in sort of traditional Silicon Valley database or, or tech companies. This is mostly found in HPC in the scientific world. This is for like array data. Like you can have your, you know, your, your particle collider can, can will spit out a bunch of these files in this type. And then Arrow is an in-memory column format that came out of Pandas and Gem.io uh, that think of this as like, it's like Parquet and Orc, but it's for in-memory data. So our data system we're building here at Carnegie Mellon, our native storage format is actually Arrow. So you can take data that our data system generates, dump it out and feed it into Pandas or, or whatever scikit-learn you want, anything that, that reads the Arrow format. So I think this is the right way to go. It is sort of, you get to the lowest common denominator, like there's, you know, the compression scheme in all these, these different, uh, these formats may not be the best for all possible applications. And certainly if you write a custom one, you could probably get much better compression or better performance, but this, this provides you interoperability. Okay. All right. So just to finish up, OLAP, it means if you, if you need an analytical database that needs to scale, then you have money because you're getting data, right? People are actually using whatever application you have and you're actually able to process it. But the more data you get, the more problems you're gonna have because, because these distributed databases are, are, you know, all the additional management concerns and, and problems that you have with the distributed system, you do have to account for, all right? So his question last time, can I, can I name, what are some interesting or, uh, I don't want to use the word good, but what are the, the main OLAP systems you could possibly look at? Well, in the cloud, Redshift and Snowflake are the, are the key two, two players. Oracle and Microsoft and Google also have their own Pacific services. But I think these two are the probably the biggest ones. So this is run if you're running on a cloud. If you want to run on-premise, um, the one that I'm actually super interested in is ClickHouse. It's a distributed in-memory column store system out of Russia from the Yandex guys. Uh, and when you read their webpage, the list of the things that they support, it's actually amazing. Like, it, like And it's open source too. Um, Presto is, runs on top of, uh, uh, I think, Spark and Hadoop. Splice Machine is HBase plus Spark. Greenplum is a forked version of uh, Postgres that, that somebody made distributed. It was a startup back in the 2000s. They got bought by EMC. The EMC says, we don't want to be a database company. So then they merged with VMware and became Pivotal. But, and they open sourced it. Vertica was uh, founded by my advisors when I was well, in, back, back in New England. They got bought by HP. Uh, the guy came and gave a talk uh, a, a, few, a few weeks ago, early in the semester. So the way to sort of think about this is like, if you have no money, start here. If you have of money, you could start over here. Like Oracle data and Teradata are super, super expensive. Like Exadata, I don't think you can buy a machine for less than like, you know, $2 million. Because you, you're buying custom hardware. Okay? All right. If you don't want to go down this route, setting up a whole distributed database, there's a newer system that I'm also very excited about called DuckDB. It's out of Europe. Uh, think of this DuckDB as like uh, SQLite for analytics. So you can run it as an embedded database. It actually, you can connect to it through the SQLite terminal, but it's a column store and it can do, you can do analytics on it in the same kind of way you can do here. So if your data can fit on a single node, DuckDB might be the right thing. And it's open source. Okay? All right, so that's it. For, for the, the main material in, in the semester, uh, the well, next class after the holiday, we'll have a guest speaker from Oracle. And again, we'll have the final review and the, the potpourri session on Wednesday. So at this point, again, uh, you should be confident enough to go out in the real world and either manage a database or use a database and know enough about to, to opine whether you know, it, the, the system you're working with is making good ideas, okay? We've covered a lot. I think you guys hopefully have, have, have you know, followed along. So I'm confident you guys can go out in the real world and discuss databases, okay? And if not, talk to me after class. Okay, see you. No, 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 no. We still have two more classes. Oh dear, coming through with my shell and crew. Two cent for a case, give me St. Nas poo. In the midst of broken bottles and crushed up cans. Met the cows in the jam, oh how dry I am. 
Cause with St. Ives in my system Crack another, I'm blessed Let's go get the next one and get over The object is to stay sober Lay on the sofa Better yet, down my sofa Who be the be stressed out Could never be son Rick and say jelly Hit the deli for a cold one Naturally blessed, yes My rap is like a laser beam The pawns in the bushes St. Ives in the canteen Crack the bottle of the St. Ives Sip it through those who don't realize The drinking ain't only to be drunk You can't drive, keep my people still alive And if the saint don't know you're from a can of paint, paint